Okay. Um, so this is a recap on yesterday. <laughs> so we talked about some summarization methods. We talked about the summary function, which can give us quantile information. We talked about summarize, which can be with a Z or an S, depending on your preference and where you are from and how you spell it. Um, and it creates a summary table of your data. And so it's creating a new tibble. It's not modifying your existing tibble, but it's telling you things about the data that you're working with and trying to summarize. And you can create whatever column names you want for that and do things like mean, sum of vari various variables within your data. We have our count function, which is really nice for looking at um, the various unique values for each value of a variable. And we talked about group by, which is super important in doing really fancy things within Summarize. And then of course we did plot, various plots. Plot was uh, for scatter plot, this for histogram and bar plot to make really quick plots. Um, I don't think we need to go over this because we just went over it, but typically this would be the beginning of the day. All right, so moving on to data cleaning. So in general, data cleaning is a process of investigating your data for inaccuracies and then changing, to modifying your data to make it what you need it to be. So the most important rule of data cleaning it's to first look at your data and make sure that it looks all right. So yesterday we did a lot of data summarization. We had some instances where we found some unusual things, right? We had in our lab, the bike data, where we found that there were some dates, the date installed value was zero in some cases, which was a little bit weird. So that would be an instance where now we might wanna clean the data um, and get rid of those or modify those in a way that made sense. Um, and usually you need to know a lot about your data and the source of the data in order to make the right modifications. So a big aspect related to this is missing data. So we've talked about NA values, which are our general missing data value, but there are also a couple of others that you could possibly run into. So we wanted you to be aware of those. We have NAN, which stands for not a number. And that's what you get when you divide zero by zero. We could also have infinity or negative infinity, which happens when you divide a positive number or a negative number, respectively, um, dividing them by zero. So if you're doing a lot of mathematical operations, it's possible that you'll run into NANs and infinite values. There are ways to look for these within um, our data. So if we have a vector, so if we pulled from a data frame a particular variable, we could look at it and ask, um, are, is, is there values that are NA? So is dot NA, and that looks for both NAN and NA, whereas NAN specifically looks for NAN, and is infinite will look for infinite. So, if you might have infinite values, you're gonna to need to do that separately. So here we're showing how that might happen. Here we have a vector where we have zero, NA and negative one. We divide this by zero, our first value is gonna become NAN, our NA stays NA and we create a negative infinite value. If we look at that with is NA, we'll have two truths because NA looks for both NANs and NA. So these two values are true. So we basically just get a logical vector back of true and false about where the values are indeed NA or not NA. And similarly, similarly is NAN and is infinite do the same sorts of things. So our only NAN values here and our only infinite value was the third value. Um, this sort of thing can be helpful if we want to maybe remove these or do something with these. If we want to ask, are there any NAs for a particular variable, we can do so using the any function. Any, yeah, I'm saying that kind of weird, any. Um, 
And so that's basically asking when we nest it or pipe it, we could do is NAA. -A. So we could do it like this as well. Let's say, I'm just gonna copy these. So I have a vector ready to go. So I could also say is NA for A and NA. And it says, yes, there is an NA among the values within the A data object. But if I do the same thing for B, I get false because it's a complete vector, meaning there are no NA values. I can also do instead of any, just are there any values? I could do all, which will ask are all the variable, uh, are all the values within this vector NA? Um, and that can be really useful, right? If we want to drop a variable where every single value is NA, that's typically not useful for data analysis. And it works the same, just use all instead of any. So in this case, we're going to get false because we definitely don't have all of our values being NA. But if instead it was this, it would be true. All right, but there are much nicer ways to look for NA values, and that's what we're going to go through now. Um, these um, sort of base R ways that we just showed you can be useful within mutate if you're trying to do something to some of these values that you have. Um, another thing that's really helpful is using our count function that we already know and love. Um, and so it not only shows us our NA values, which we talked about, we had a great question about whether it does that, and it does. Some of the other base R functions that do something similar, you may have come across if you're already used to using R a little bit called table, does not give you NA values. So I prefer count for sure. Um, but it also tells you if you have very rare values. So if we take a look at our bike data, so we should already have, um, oops, library JHUR in our loaded. But if we want to create our bike data set um, and we wanted to count, I'm, just, I'm not here, I'm piping it in here, I'm just putting it inside the count um, function. I see that I have mostly this particular subtype. And I have four NA values, that's important to know, but also very few values for these other two subtypes. So I might go back and investigate what those are. If I'm trying to do comparisons, it's not going to be appropriate to compare a thousand different data values to three values or to one value. So it's important to look at that as well and, and figure out, are these actually NA values? Do these need to be changed? A really awesome function for working with missing data is the Nannier package. Um, so it's a, I get apparently named after the Narnia, <laughs> um, like fictional place and uh, appreciation for that. And the idea that that sounds kind of like Nan. So, um, and so that's the name for that. Um, and so we would need to install Nannier if we don't already have it. So it's important for us to run that if we haven't ever used it. And of course we would need to load it. And it might ask me to, to restart or something. I'm gonna let it do it because that's usually what you wanna let it do. Um, and we're going to work with some data related to air quality um, so that we can sort of test out looking at these NA values. So the air quality data set comes within R. Got an error. That's interesting. I think I had Nanny or working just fine earlier, though. So hopefully we'll be fine. We'll find out. 
Um, so if I want to investigate more about this air quality data set, I can type in question mark air quality. And in my help pane here, I can see that these are daily air quality measurements from New York in 1973, May to September. These are my variables and measurements about wind, temperature, time, day, or sorry, um, month, day, and uh, ozone. So if you're living in Baltimore and you recently experienced the poor air quality from the fire, <laughs> then you understand why this is an important public health thing to look at. So I'm going to make a data set called air quality from the air quality data set that comes from R. I'm just naming it air qual so that I can work with it. I'm gonna make it actually the tipple. And great, I am having problems with the packages. All right, there we go. All right, so within the non-ER package, there are a couple, we'll talk about, I think, three functions that are really, really useful. So we can ask, uh, what's the percent complete, meaning not any values of, of the entire data set, which is a really nice single measurement to determine, do I have any values across my entire data frame? So I can, hopefully this will allow me to do it. So it's saying that 95% of this data is complete or not NA. And if I were interested in a particular variable, I could select that out and then ask that. Um, and I would get apparently 75%. So we can do a different one here. Let's do wind. Let me do it on here. Ah, oh, that's right. You have to select it first. It's finicky. All right, so that's 100, meaning there are no any values. That is a complete variable. So in this case, I did. I, I had percent wind within percent complete. In this case, I, I moved it out and I selected it first. So non -ER is not part of the tidyverse, so it's going to be a little bit funky in some ways and how it interacts with the verbs for the tidyverse. So yeah, sometimes it gives the illusion that it didn't work. Also, our, uh, our studio sometimes just gets a little glitchy and it needs time to catch up. So that's the other reason. Yeah, good question though, because then it, it can feel like magic. <laughs> or that R is against you, but it's not. All right, so that can be nice if you wanted to know about a specific variable, like ozone was really important to us, for example, but it's usually nicer to get a sense of the entire data frame and what each of the variables look like. So here we have this function called miss missing variable summary. So miss, there's all kinds of functions within um, this package. You can see there's so many. Uh, we're trying to show the ones that we think are useful based on our experience. And so here, this is giving us the number of missing values. So the count, there are 37 NA values and the percentage of the total ozone values. So 24% are missing for ozone, which is unfortunate because it's probably our most interesting variable of the data set. Uh, but maybe you're a bit more visual and you'd rather see a visual of it, you can also create a plot super easily. So they have GG in front of them. We'll see later that there's a really important package called GG plot. So that kind of 
uh, reminds us, evokes that we're going to be using, we're going to be creating a plot. And we want to plot the missing variables. And so this is going to give us the count of the missing variables. So we have 37 here, um, um, like seven or something for our solar. Yep, seven. Wow. OK, surprised myself. Um, OK, so recall that our math functions do not like NA values. So when we were doing the summarization lecture yesterday, we got NAs back when we tried to, to do something like any of these functions on a vector with NA values. Of course, we can put NA.remove if we don't want to have that and we want to get the right output. Um, but just a reminder that that is the case. So looking at some other data classes like logical values, that's also going to be the case. So we saw if we had unknown, for example, or NA, um, we're going to, if we tried to, with logical values, we saw that they could be evaluated for true as one and false as zero. So we can actually sum across these values, but if we have an NA value, we'll get an NA back, just like our other numeric classes, like we just saw. Um, but we can again add our NA.remove equals true. And here we get a value of four because there are four true values. So just be mindful of the fact that this is going to be important not only for numeric values, but also for logical values. All right. Um, really important to know that filter will automatically get rid of your NA values. So it's a little bit sneaky. And the reason it does that is it can't tell if an NA value meets the condition that you're asking it to filter by. So it assumes that it doesn't meet the condition and it drops them. This might be OK. You might not be interested in your NA values, but it could be that your NA values are important and that you're going to need them later in your analysis or later in your plots. So it's something to keep in mind. So an example of that here. Um, I'm taking my air quality data and I'm going to filter it Oops. where ozone is less than five. There's just not a lot of cases. So I have just two values here. So now we only have two values. That means all of our NAs, remember 24% of ozone is NA values. So if I look at just the air quality data, I can see even in the first six rows, there is NA values. I've dropped all of those. But maybe it's possible that for my data, an NA value means it was too low to detect, in which case I want those data, right? I want to know that I have an NA value. In which case, I would need to add another conditional inside my filter. So I can use my OR operator to say, I have another condition that is also OK for ozone to meet. And that's that it be NA. So that's when our is.na function can be handy. So here I'm saying it can be less than 5 or it can be NA. Note that we're not using ozone is exactly equal to NA um, because sometimes like it's a little bit messed up thinking it's a character. And so it's much better to use is.na. All right, so I'll go through coding this just because it, it looks a little bit intense, but it's not too bad. And so now I have 39 values, a lot more values. Yeah, really great point, Roland. It's good to have other examples from real life too. I mean, this is real air quality data from 1974, but it's not as relevant to us, maybe. <laughs> um, okay, 
So sometimes we do want to drop our NA values though. Maybe it was something like, this is when the machine malfunctioned and we didn't get a measurement. In those cases, uh, we might want to drop it. And there's a really nifty function called drop NA that does that for us. Uh, something that confuses people sometimes is that because our data is in a data frame, in a, in a tibble or a table where we have, you know, multiple columns uh, and rows, if we get rid of something for ozone, we're going to get rid of it, the values for that NA for all of the columns, right? So we are going to reduce the size of our data frame. So on the previous slide, let's see. So here we have 116. If I just look at the dimensions of air quality, oops, got to spell it right. I see that it's, well, I have it up here, 153, but now it's all the way down to 116. So I can see that I have indeed dropped rows, and I dropped the rows uh, where ozone was NA. So now I could check that if I wanted to with using my percent complete function. That might be a good time to do that. One place that I, I use this drop in A a lot, um, you know, assuming that we these these data are not missing like systematically, or if it's just random or something like that, you'll have to drop them before you want to do any sort of like multiple regression or stats analysis, it cannot do it when there are NAs in any of these like numerical columns. Yeah, good point. We can, we'll have some examples of that too, <laughs> I think, for your stats. Yeah, it can be really useful to, to get rid of these. Or sometimes with plots, we don't want to plot NA values. Um, of course, Roland was giving us an example where we do, but we probably maybe need to recode them, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but yeah, it, it can be useful to also remove them. We can do it across the entire data set if you just don't put anything inside the parentheses, and that's going to drop all of the NA values. Remember, we only had seven for solar, so now we're just down to 111. It's always good to check our dimensions and make sure that they make sense. So. For that, I just do air qual drop NA. And I don't need to put anything inside. So it can be used for either the entire data frame or um, a single variable. So I could call this air qual complete, something like this. And then I could do my percent complete. Best. Ah, I printed down here a hundred percent. Looks good. All right. So <clears throat> we just talked about how drop NA drops our row values that have NAs for either an entire data frame or based on a particular variable. Um, but sometimes it's helpful to remove the columns that have missing values. And so we can figure out which columns those are by using this nannier function, which is missing variable which, miss var which. And so here we see that in it's the ozone and solar columns, which we know about. And so we can say, we can select to not have those. Um, so we can use our not uh, you know, like we did with our not equal to, we can do not um, the miss very which of the air quality data. So we can select to not keep those variables. Uh, and this is something that, that people often request how to do this. So I would code this just like so. I'm selecting my columns just like normal. Um, but I am selecting particularly those that do not 
have missing variables. So um, typically, I think we have to nest this one because Miss Fairwitch is part of the Nannier package and again, is not super friendly with Tidyverse. You can try it out though, but I think you might get an error for that if you don't nest it. Okay, so um, sometimes we wanna change our values that are NA. We wanna keep them, but we wanna change them. And so remember for our bike install data, sometimes we have a value that should be an NA. So remember in our, our bike data, we had zero values for our date installed, which that doesn't make for make a lot of sense. That probably should be an NA. So we can do that using a function called NA if. So basically, NA if this variable is equal to zero. And so we would use this inside our mutate function. We take our bike data, we're gonna mutate the date installed variable. And just like usual, you know, we're just overwriting our date installed data um, with our mutate function. We always have our equal sign to whatever it is that we're performing an action on. And we're performing the NA if action on the original date installed data and creating NA values where we have zeros. And so the output here, when we do count, we see that we've changed our data to have NA values. Sometimes we have NA values that we want to have a different value for. So say we did this and then found out, oh, actually, those are from 2005. So we should replace NA with something. So we can use the replace NA function of tidy of the tidier package to do the opposite of NAF. So now we have 126 NA values, and we're going to assign them to 2005. So just like before, we're overriding our date installed variable. We're using the replace NA function on the original date installed data, original being the current state, where we have NA values, and we're converting those to 2005. And now we see that in the output. So note that this only works if you want to replace it with a numeric value. If you want to replace it with a character value, we're going to talk about that in a bit. It'll just be like any time you do any character uh, recoding. OK, but note of caution, really need to be mindful of what's in your data. Um, sometimes removing those NA values is really misleading, like we talked about. Um, and that can be a very bad thing to do. <laughs> Sometimes it's really bad to keep them in. So you really need to think about what caused those NA values in the first place. Was it you know, something that malfunctioned, uh, not you didn't get a measurement, maybe you don't need those values. Um, you know, really need to think about why they got reported. Um, and like we said, if it's something that it's like it was too low to be detected, you might want to keep it as a zero and recode it as a zero. Another example is often in surveys, you might have an NA value. For example, um, on a sur survey about cigarette smoking, which I had worked on, it reported as zero if a student had tried cigarettes but did not smoke this week. So, um, you know, you need to think about what that means. So in this case, an NA and a zero are very different. All right. Um, calculating percentages are especially problematic with NA values. And that's because our denominator changes. So just an example of that. Also showing you how to calculate percentages which isn't um, a direct thing that you can do in the tidyverse. You have to kind of calculate it out yourself. So let's say that we want within our count data frame, which normally gives us you know, the unique values and the count. Let's say that we also want to add a percent variable. So we're creating a new variable and we're taking our n count column and we're dividing the value by the sum of all of those, which would give our average multiplying that by 100. And so we get our uh, percent. 
So if we include our ni values, then our total n is going to be very different than if we do not include them. And then our percentages could change. So here we have 24 for 2007 and 22. But what if there's some rule that they only fund maintenance of trails, bike trails that are at least 24% um, of the bike trails, then you know this could be important. Okay, so in summary, we have our is NA function to say if there's any, if there's an NA value. Any lets us know if there are any of them. All is for all. Our count function again is super helpful for finding those NA values. The non-error package has lots of nifty functions. ggmisvar is one of the useful ones for making a nice plot, which can be a really good way. Um, filter is going to automatically remove NA values unless we add onto our condition an or is NA. And we can drop our NA values either from a complete data frame or for a particular variable for the data frame using drop NA. And uh, you need to be careful about what those NA values mean. It's going to be case by case kind of situation. All right. And with that, we are ready for part one of our lab. We have two parts for this module. OK, we're going to start talk about recoding data, which is one of my favorite topics of all time for R. And I put in the chat how you would create the data that I'm using if you're following along. Um, no need to follow along because we'll have examples in our um, lab, which will be really similar. So if you just copy paste this code into a chunk and run it like this, you'll be ready to go. All right, so um, well, this is our data. It's about diets. We have two diets. We have various genders. We have information about the initial weight and the weight change. Notice that gender is coded in a lot of different ways. So if we count that, the unique values, we can see there's a lot of inconsistency. And this is a toy data set because I wanted to make it especially nasty, but um, also small. <laughs> so um, this might seem like a silly example, but in reality, if you have a large data set, sometimes you actually get data that looks like this. So how do we fix that? DPIR to the rescue, it's super helpful. If we tried to do this in Excel, this could take a lot of time. We might make mistakes. We might miss some of them. It's problematic. Um, mutate is super helpful for, or mutate as well as another function, recode, it can be super helpful. So pretty appropriately named, recode, recodes things. Um, but note that you need to do this within the mutate function. So basically, the general format here is the variable that we're trying to fix. And then after a comma, we're going to specify a bunch of recoding statements. So this is in the opposite format of rename. In this case, we put the old value, the equal sign, and then the new value that we want. I know that inconsistency is annoying. That is how it works, though. And then you can separate by a comma and add a bunch of new values. This will look more clear when we have an example. OK, so if I wanted to recode this data here, I could use all of these different statements. And I would have to because I have a lot of issues, right? So I have my mutate function. I'm changing gender. I want to recode gender. So I'm going to use just like before, anytime we use mutate, my equal sign, and then whatever I'm doing to what I have existing in my data currently. So I'm gonna recode the existing gender variable. And these are all the recoding statements that I'm doing. I don't have to have quotes on what is currently in my data, but I can. Um, but I have to have quotes around the new values. 
if you get lost on when to use quotes and when not to use quotes, remember that we have a resource for that on our resource page. So after we recode, um, we can take a look at our count of gender. And we see that now we have ni nicely just three different unique values, which is what we would want. So all the male values are coded together, all the female values, all the other values. Um, or you can use a function called case win. And you can kind of forget about recode if you want to, because case win can do everything that recode does and more. Uh, but we show you recode because it's nice and simple. Um, but you have to do exact changes. So you exactly replace a very a value for another value. But case win can do lots of other more flexible things. It looks pretty similar. So here is sort of the equivalent with case win, but it looks a little bit weird. So we're gonna walk through it. So all of this is basically the same. Instead of recode, we're using case win though. And we have to re-specify the variable that we're referring to each time. So here we're saying when gender, it's based on a condition now, just like filter, when gender is exactly equal to M, and so I need quotes here because I'm, I'm saying when it's exactly equal to the character M, then I want to recode and I'm gonna use the tilde symbol for that, which is in the top left corner, just by our back tick. I'm gonna recode this to male. When it's lowercase M, I'm also gonna recode it to male, et cetera. And then when I do this and I look at my count, this almost looks exactly the same, except I have some NA values. So what happened here? What happened if we take a look at the data is our first and third and fifth value became NAs. If we look at the original data, our first value was male, our third value was other, and our fifth value was female. Those are the values that we wanted that we wanted to keep. We didn't specify those when we did our case win function because we thought they were correct. We don't need to change those. So if this happens to you, this is because you need to add this extra step here because case win automatically drops anything that you don't specify and it creates an NA value. So you need to make sure that you do all the conditions or you can um, specify to keep the original data. And so we have to, it looks a little strange, kind of think of it as like, if all of these conditions are not met um, and that value is true, then recode as this. And so the recoding part for true can either be something new or it can be the original values. Again, this will be easier with looking at the example. So here, I want to keep the original values because those were correct. So I just need to add this line here where I say true tilde gender. Okay. And now I have exactly what I had when I did recode. So in this instance, it looks like more work to use case win. And that's technically true. But you'll see that we can actually take this much further and do much better things with case win. And we'll see an evolution of that through the lecture. So for example, instead of having so many lines of all these recoding pieces, we could instead say, use our in uh, operator, and we could specify all the ways that we think people have messed up coding mail and say that every time any of these occur, I want to recode it to male. Anytime we have any of these variation for female, I'm going to recode it to female, um, et cetera. I don't have my true equals gender. I should probably add that, or my true tilde gender, I should say, um, just in case so that I keep whatever I had. Um, or in some cases, it's useful to not have it. So I make sure that I 
have recoded everything that I needed because otherwise it'll be tagged as an NA value for me to, to check. Um, but in this case, I have specified everything that shows up in the data. So it's okay. I'm not gonna end up with any NA values, but this is an okay way of doing it. And it shows you an option for what you could do. We're gonna show an even better way. But another reason why case when is really nice is it lets us do really sophisticated things. So it can help us to create new variables based on conditions related to our other variables. So we can kind of think about this as like doing lots of filtering steps and mutating steps and combining this all together. And it's, it's really quite powerful. So here we're creating a new variable called effect. So we wanna know based on the weight start and the weight change, whether the diet increased the weight, decreased the weight, or the weight stayed the same. So we're using our mutate function. Again, case one only works within mutate. We're creating a new variable called effect. And we're saying that when weight change, which is a variable that already exists in our data, is greater than zero, I want to code my effect value to be increase. If it's exactly equal to zero, I want it to be same. And if it is less than zero, I want it to be decreased. So you can see how that's really useful. And this can really give us um, a sense of what the diets are doing. So we can see in our count table, how often diet A versus diet B is causing a change in the diet that, or in the weight that might be a good or bad thing. And we can plot that data, which we'll show how to do later. I don't think our data is really conclusive about which diet's better. Um, seems like more things happen if you're on the B diet in terms of greater fluctuation, but I don't know what that means yet. Not enough data. All right, working with strings. We can do even more sophisticated things by looking at specific pieces of our values that are character. So remember these are called character strings when we have values that are words. There's a really helpful package called Stringer that we can use to work with strings. That's part of the tidyverse. So it looks for part of a character string. If you're used to other languages or base R, you might be familiar with something called grep or G sub, which helps you to find and substitute things. Um, all of the functions are going to start with str underscore, and that's how you know they're from the stringer package. So we'll have functions like str detect, str replace. So str detect is the same as grep if you're used to grep. It is telling us if something is found, if the pattern is found in the value, whereas replace is replacing that pattern. So in our uh, data here, uh, we could look at our effect data that we just created, and we could use the str detect function. Here I'm pulling out the data from effect because one tricky thing about S, uh, stringer functions is they only work on vectors. And that's okay because if we're using mutate, it works very nicely within mutate. Um, but for these examples where we're just looking at a vector or something, um, you know, we have to pull out those variables. We can't work on a tibble. And we'll show a tibble example in a second. So we pull out the data here. Remember, this is just increase, decrease, or same. We're just getting the first six values so you can see it. I'm asking to look for places where I have a pattern of D. And so the in word increase does not have a D or decrease obviously does. Um, if it's lowercase, this is case sensitive. So I'm gonna get false values for everything. If I do uppercase, I see that it is detected in the second and third value for the effect variable. Um, 
Replace works as you might expect. It replaces the pattern. So now I'm just replacing capital D with lowercase d. So I need to specify the string. So now that I've created an object, which is pulled out the data, um, the effect data, I, I can um, just work with that from now. And I can look for um, the pattern capital D and replace it with lowercase d. So you see that here in the output. STR replace all will replace every instance within a value. So it helps to look at an example for this one. There are cases where you might want to do this. Perhaps you have something formatted in a particular way where you have underscores. You now want those to be periods. Um, you can do so by, in this example, we're replacing every E with a capital E. So our str replace will only change the first instance, whereas str replace all will change every instance. So here I'm showing str replace you, you know, without all, and it just replaces the first version or the first instance of e, whereas the other e's remain lowercase, and here they are capitalized. So in this example, it's kind of just a toy silly example, but there are cases where this could be useful. You can also subset. So this is really helpful if you have like a really long value and you don't want such a long value name, um, or it has multiple meanings within parts of it. You can specify what character to start it and what character to end at. And again, you need to specify you know, what your string is that you're working on. So here we're saying the first through third character. So now we have just increase, decrease, change to ink and deek <laughs> or something. Um, and so that's how that works. All right, so going back to our data, looking at a tibble, which is what we're typically gonna be doing, how would we use this in a functional sense? So let's say that we want to detect every time there's a capital M in our data, and we want to show that data. We can combine SDR detect and filter and do really nice things. So I can say, I want to take my diet data. I want to filter it down so that within the gender variable, so I'm saying that my string is the gender variable, I want to detect the pattern of capital M. And so that's going to filter down my data to only show me the rows where a gender value with a capital M um, is, is there. So that allows me to filter my data in a much more sophisticated way than what we've typically done. It's been really nice for numeric values, but this is showing us how we can do nice things for character values. All right, but back to our original problem, we have all kinds of problems, right? With the way our data is recode, um, coded for gender. We did this with recode, it was okay. But what if we missed something, right? What if we didn't notice there was also lowercase m-a-l-e and then we still have some inconsistency and we're gonna miss it. Similarly, what if we do the same thing here. It's an improvement in the fact that it's a little bit easier to read. I don't have to do a single line for each one, but I could still miss something. We can improve this with Stringer. So we can use SDR detect within our case when function to look for patterns within our um, values of gender and code our values to be something based on a piece of the gender values. So I'm gonna walk through that a little bit. So I'm, I'm changing our gender data using the mutate function. Again, case when always has to be inside of mutate, just like recode. And I'm using SDR detect to figure out what it is that I want to change. So that's my condition for case when. 
So I have to specify that gender is the string that I'm looking at. So it's the values within the gender variable. And I'm going to look for patterns like so. So if it starts with an M, or a lowercase m or a capital M. So this is just the or statement. It looks like a line because I have it exactly lined up across these three lines. This caret indicates that I am looking for a character at the start of a line and the dollar sign indicates the end of a line. So all of these are looking at the start of the line if it of uh, the value, is it M? Lowercase m or capital M, is it lowercase f or lo capital F, and what to recode those two. Yeah, um, so it's allowing us to specify multiple patterns to look for within one character description. It is a little bit tricky. So this is a better solution than the others. The other solutions work and it's okay to use those, but this is better because it's more robust in case we have other typos. And so of course we could have other typos that we don't even catch, like um, someone puts woman, it's a W, right? But this is definitely more robust than the other solutions that we showed. Okay, so that is better. Woohoo! excellent. All right, there's just a tiny bit left, which is separating and uniting data. We can unite columns together, which can be helpful. Um, so here we want to unite uh, our diet column and our effect column. And we can do that with all of these various arguments and the unite function. So we're gonna unite with these columns and we're gonna create a new column and call it change. So the column argument is telling what column our new column will be. And the remove function specifies if we want to drop the old columns. And if we need to, we can specify what we want in between the values of those two columns when we unite them, but the default is underscore. So here we had a variable called diet, which just had A and B, and we had a variable that was effect, which was increase, decrease, or same. And now they're combined together into a variable called change. And we have underscore in between the values that we had for the two of those. We can also separate, which is super useful. I think more useful than the unite function, because typically it's nicer to have a single meaningful unit in a variable. And so maybe we want to plot just diet A, for example, then we could do so by splitting that variable that we just made, this one, the change one, so that we have back our data like we had before, where we have our diet data in one column and our effect in another column. So in this case, we, um, specify what column we want to work with. So column in this case is the column that we want to work with, not the name of the new columns. So it's a little bit odd because those are kind of different. And then into is going to specify the names of the new columns. So we're going to change the change column and set and separate it into a column called diet and capital change. And the separator is the underscore because we have underscores in our values. So we go from lowercase change here to two variables, diet and change. All right, so just in the nick of time, the summary here, we have two functions that we talked about for recoding um, values, like character values. They need to be done within the mutate function. And that is recode and case when. Recode has to have exact values to change, it, but it's quite simple. Whereas case when ha can recode entire values based on all sorts of fancy conditions and we can do lots of cool things. So if you don't wanna remember recode, you don't have to. Um, 
you can do accomplish everything with case one. Um, but remember that case one's a little bit trickier and that if you don't specify what's gonna happen for everything, you need to do uh, true and the variable name that you wanna keep for the original variable. Otherwise, everything will be changed that's not specified to an NA value. There's some other weird aspects here where um, we have to work up with quotes and um, for case win for both the new value, the condition and the new value, uh, whereas recode can tolerate not having it for the original values. So just basically when you're recoding, probably stick to using quotes because there's no problem there. And then we have the stringer package, which helps us look at parts of values. And so that's great for doing really fancy filters or looking for particular parts of character values of character variables. And uh, we do that with the SDR detect function. But there's also other helpful functions within Stringer like STR subset, which is where we parse. We took increase and decrease and just parsed it to the first three characters. It's a super helpful function. STR replace, where we replace parts of a character string to be something else. And this does it for only the first instance. Replace all does all instances for a value of a variable. And there's others as well. Like if you have white space, you can trim off the white space, bunch of things. And then we talked about separate and unite. Separate splits columns into additional columns and unite can combine columns. Um, and then here we can also use a colon to indicate if we have sequential uh, columns next to one another. So um, if I wanted to combine um, diet and effect, let me show you the original data. Diet and effect rate are separated from each other. So I couldn't use the colon there, but if I had sequential data that's right next to each other, so say I wanted weight change and effect together, I could just put weight change colon effect. It's not super useful for this example, but you could see if you had five columns next to each other that had different pieces of an address that the colon could be really nice because I only need to say the starting column and the, the last ending column. I'm gonna start with some review of the data cleaning material that we ended with last week uh, before we jump into the lab for that so that we're kind of in the right headspace. And uh, also I know we went through it quickly so that we could get through it. Um, so I wanna give it enough time to really cover the material. Okay, so um, coming here to our materials and schedule on our website, um, coming down here to data cleaning, and you're going to want to go, let's see, I'll tell you which slide after the first lab. All right, so slide 35. I can put this link in the chat so that you can go exactly to that slide. If you're following along. All right, so just wanted to review how we recode variables. All right, and we were working with an example of the type of data that you might receive. I mean that in the chat in case you wanted to try working with it. Um, and so in this example, we had things coded many, many different ways, which was a challenge to work with. So that's one issue with this data. The other thing is there's really inadequate um, measurement of, of various genders. So something to point out. Um, but so we basically had these four variables and we really wanted to work on recoding that gender variable so that it was more consistent. Because as you can see here, 
we have very inconsistent multiple ways of, of coding um, the same basic value. And so there are a few ways that we covered that we could uh, fix this. So one way was using the recode function, which is what we can use to make exact swaps. So we need the mutate function for this, which is the same for case win, which is that other function that we talked about for recoding. And so the general format would be our, our typical mutate format, where we'd have our data that we're piping into a mutate function, the variable that we want to fix, so we're going to overwrite it, and then the equal sign we do with mutate. And here we have our recode function. We have to describe the variable that we want to fix. And then we would have an old value equals new value. So that's the opposite of the order that we typically see with rename. So it's a little bit tricky. And then you would put a comma in between having multiple things that you're recoding. So for example, here we have multiple statements and we have a comma in between these. But remember, recode is specifically for these exact, like I know that there's an M, a capital M, and this is what I would want to recode it to. So it's a cool function, but it's not as powerful as case win. So you may see it, but case win can do everything that recode can do and more. So that's why we really wanted to emphasize case win. And so case win also needs mutate. And so we would pipe in our data, use the mutate function, say the variable that we want to work with and change, and then equal sign, just like recode, just like other mutate functions, the case win function. And then here we're using conditions. So case win always uses conditions, just like we're used to seeing for filter. So remember, in filter, we have this double equal sign, which means exactly equal to. And so in this case, we're saying the gender variable, when it is exactly equal to capital M, then make that this character string. When gender is instead exactly equal to lowercase m, also recode this to this character string, et cetera. We saw though that when we do this, if we don't remember everything that we need to recode and we don't put that true statement, then we get NA values for anything that isn't stated. And so our way of overcoming that is to add this true and the tilde sign and the value for not meeting any of the above conditions. And remember that that can be a specific value or it could be the name of the variable, in which case it will use the existing variable values. So that means it will only recode the things that we have already described in the conditions and it will leave everything else the same but we need to tell it to do that. So it's a little easier to see in the actual example. Here we are, again, working with our gender variable using case when got all of our statements, our conditions, but now all that we've done here is added this true tilde gender. And if you're struggling where that tilde sign uh, key is on your keyboard, it's usually on the left corner. Notice that everything here needs to be in quotes. Um, and that's because these are string characters. So the values need to be in quotes. The variable name does not need to be in quotes. In fact, it shouldn't be. So remember, string characters are values that are made up of letters. I know that's a very tricky point, um, but it's so that R knows that we're trying to do something that should be interpreted as a character um, and not a variable or an argument 
or something like that. Okay, so the main thing here is remembering this true thing, or you can specify all the statements. Um, but you know, in case you forget one, it's good to put the true here. You'll know if you forgot because you'll end up with some new NA values. And it's good to check by using that count function. All right, and then we talked about how you can use other conditions, again, just like filter. So here I'm using that in operator, the percent sign, the word in, another percent sign, which you might remember from the subsetting lecture, is when we have multiple conditions um, that we're looking for exactly equal to. So this is equivalent to making a bunch of statements where it's M is exactly equal to, or double equal sign. Um, when gender is exactly equal to M, then make it male. So this is a little bit easier to code. If we need to add more statements, it's much easier. You just add it to this line after a comma um, within this parentheses. So this is a little bit better than this other option. All right. Then if you recall, we, we made this even better. Um, and that's when we started introducing in some stringer stuff. So the reason here that I don't have true is because all of our statements are described. So every, every single pattern that we see within the data is there. So nothing will end up being an NA value, but I certainly could add true tilde gender just to be careful. And that's a great idea. So the really cool thing about case win is that we can do much more sophisticated things. Like we can create new variables out of existing variables and the conditions that those variables meet. So I can make a new variable called effect, which again, these have to be done in the mutate function. So it makes sense that I'm making new variables within mutate because that's where I do mutates where I modify an existing variable or I create new variables. And so here I can say, based on the weight change variable, if it's greater than zero, I want to code it as increase. If it's exactly equal to zero, I want it to be the same. If it's less than zero, decrease. And in this case, there's nothing else for it to be. If I had an NA value, perhaps I'd want it, be, it to be coded as don't know or something like that. Sometimes we want our NA values to actually be NA, in which case adding that true statement doesn't necessarily help us because um, we don't really need to put in that we want our um, NA values to be NA. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. It's mostly useful to have that true statement when we're modifying an existing variable and we want to make sure that we keep anything we forgot to code, that we forgot a condition for. So we can see that we ended up creating this new variable on the far right from that. And that's just looking at the data after we did that. And then we saw when we add in string information, we can really take this to a next level. So we did this with the stringer function and stringer has all these str underscore functions that are really helpful. And we talked about how if you're used to other languages where you may have used grep or gsub, um, 
or if you're used to base R, it also has these, this is has similar uh, counterparts that do the same thing. And so those are str detect, which looks for a pattern and gives us something as true if it's there. And str replace, which replaces a pattern. Okay, so here I was working with the, the diet data and I pulled out some of one of the, um, I, I just pulled out um, the effect variable here so I could take a look at a little bit of it. And I see that I have increase, decrease, all those words. I can, what the str detect function does is it basically just tests it is that pattern there and it's going to give me a true or a false and it's case sensitive so if i look for a lowercase d all of my values will be false if i look for a capital d i will see that my decrease values will say true importantly um you know we need to remember that our patterns go in quotes because they're character strings str replace does a really similar thing, but it's only going to do it for the first value that it sees for that pattern or the first time that it sees that instance of that pattern. So here we're doing almost the same thing, but we're replacing capital D with lowercase d. And so here we see that the capital D goes away and we're left with uh, lowercase d. But if we were to try to do a letter like E, we would need to use replace underscore all to replace all of them. So here we see with str replace, it only changes the first instance of that pattern. So sometimes you'll need that for various reasons. Like say you have something where it's coded like this, where it's a bunch of underscores and you want to change them all to periods, then you would want to use str replace all. So what I mean here is like if I had data where um, I had variable or values within it, I'm just gonna make a new chunk here. You know, I had some sort of like <laughs> I don't know what I'm making, but. Um, you can imagine a case where you might have something like this. And so when I take a look at example, Um, I see that I have values within a variable that have underscores multiple times. And so if I wanted to replace all of those, I would need to use str replace all. And I need a vector for this. So I actually need to pull the value out. So actually, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna make this a vector instead. So I don't have to pull it, make it simple. I'm gonna specify that my string is example and I want to replace a pattern that is underscores and I'm gonna replace it with periods. So here I can see that both of the periods have changed. And if I switch to, to just str replace, then only the first underscore gets changed. 
str sub is how I get the subset, and I just specify the first character, the, the, the location of the character that I want to work with, and the, where it starts and where it ends. So in this case, I said the first character through the third character. So here I could do something similar. And I could say six and eight. Let's try that. And here we can see that I have the six through eighth character one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and the six through eighth character here just these three. And that can be really useful if we wanted just like the first part of something. All right, so the really cool thing is when we could add filter and SDR detect together, we could filter for specific patterns. And so I could find all the rows where gender has an M in it, a capital M. That was really useful. And when we really made our our, our fancy version of trying to recode our data, not using recode, not using case win with these really long in statements, we could do something like this, where we have str detect within our case win function, and we specify the variable as the string that we're working with. And then we showed that we could use uh, a caret symbol to specify the start of a pattern. So I want the start of this character string to be either lowercase m or starting with capital M. And then I would recode it to mail. So this is a much more robust solution. And again, yeah, it might be good to add this comma true tilde gender in case I left anything and I don't want to create any NA values. Um, so I only need that if I want to make sure I haven't, if I, if I'm not sure that I haven't specified every condition, if I haven't specified every condition, I will end up with NA values. All right. Um, and then we talked a little bit about uniting and separating columns. Uniting, we just wrote out the columns that we're uniting. And we wrote the name that we're going to change that column to. Um, and you can also just describe if you want to remove those columns or keep them. And then the separate function, we had our column that we're separating. So in this case, it's now the column we just made. And then this into argument where we need to list out with our combine function the names of the new variables that we're creating and specify what we're, what the separator was for that. So here we had a underscore increase and we're wanting to separate by this underscore to create a new couple of variables from this variable. And so we're creating diet and change. And so now we have split that other variable, which was lowercase change, into a diet variable and a change variable based on this underscore to separate by. All right.